Everybody, it's Monday Night Football on the Sports Exchange. No, I am anything but Howard Cosell. The guy stinks. Sorry, Howard fans. But Monday Night Football is a brand, and we got it tonight. And we are happy to be joined by Coach John Bonamago, a man who's been well-traveled. Jeremy <laughs> B's wearing the Lions cap, so you know he made a stop there. And, Coach, welcome to the broadcast, and we're looking forward to having you on Certainly a lot more times, though, but this is a good first act for us to go out there and talk a lot of football. Just, you know, folks, traveling man, John Bonamega, before I go to you, Coach, okay, I want to let everybody know that the audio version of the Sports Exchange can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcast. Please hit the red subscribe button on South, on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for 1,000 subscribers. Please also comment, like, and share the broadcast, want to be a guest, and topic ideas at southfordertribune at gmail.com, or you can participate in the chat room. If you want to contact me, you can also contact me at Twitter at Tribune South. If you want to advertise cost efficiently, call me at 954-304-4941. And in the eyes of Brent Musburger, we are live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. So, well, I guess, Coach, a little bit more of a lively introduction here. Keep you going. Keep us all going. Welcome to the Sports Exchange, Coach, and looking forward to having you more of a great first time, first act for us. Great to be here, Scotty. Thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. It's our pleasure as well. All right, George Icorn, this guy, like and I, Coach, we've been working together over 43 years, so what's, what's another few more, right, George? Uh, so looking forward to it. Looking forward to talking to Coach, too. Great, great program we got. And last but not least, smoking Jeremy B, who's been on both ends of the doubleheader. And yes, he, he was permitted to wear the Lions cap tonight because I have to make sure that in some particular cases, I bend the rules a little bit and he gets to do it on these particular broadcasts, Jeremy. I appreciate it and I'm happy to be here. All right. Well, your first project here is to talk about Will Vogel's comments. So go ahead, Jeremy. He goes, first off, thank you for answering my question. You played wide receiver and quarterback at Central Michigan. What propelled you to coach special teams and what do you like about it the most? I would say uh, it was kind of luck of the draw in terms of what propelled me to it. Um, and what kept me there is, uh, you know, one of those deals when, when you find something that you enjoy uh, and, you know, when other people think you're good at it, they're going to keep you there. But I think the thing that uh, I enjoyed most about coaching special teams was it allowed me to work with the entire team. Uh, and in fact, other than the head coach, uh, the special teams coach is probably the only coach on the staff that speaks to the entire team every single day. So in that regard, it really did a lot in preparing me, you know, for that opportunity to be a head coach. Now, I got to say one thing about coach. Him and I are actually Kennedy babies. He was born in 1963 in August. It looks like you know, I was born December of 62. So, you know, coach, you and I, there aren't many of us Ken John F. Kennedy babies. I don't talk politics, but it's okay to mention John F. Kennedy, <laughs> knowing that we're both a rare breed here. What can I tell you? All right, well, let's start from the beginning, okay? But before I do, I want to, you know, I'm so inspired by you because you're a cancer survivor, and obviously you had a situation in your tonsils, and you caught it earlier, and it was very treatable. We're going to certainly talk about this on another show, so I just want to congratulate you for being a cancer survivor once again on another edition of No Limits. We'll tell your story. Thank you, Scotty. Like we've talked about off the air, I mean, it's uh, there's a lot to that, and to do it justice, probably it does require some time, but I really appreciate you uh, uh, recognizing that. And I mean, I'm sure uh, we all know somebody that's been through that, or maybe you have a family member, uh, even people out there that are listening. You know, I would say, you know, without going too much into depth is remember that those people have families and they need your prayers and support as well. You know, I mean, uh, for me in my case, uh, you know, I was a very, a very public position and man, the, the outpouring of 
the support came from all directions. But I will tell you that, you know, having a wife and young kids at the time, uh, don't, you know, if, if there's somebody that's close to you, don't forget about those people as well, because they need their, they need your prayer and support to, as well. Well, again, we're going to devote an entire show to it, but while I'm actually talking about it, in, on May 11th, marked the 50th year that my grandpa, Sidney Morganroth, died of lung cancer, and I vowed to never smoke. When he died and 50 years later, I never have. So what can I tell you? I, I could find other adventurous ways to, to get into trouble, but it wasn't going to be that way. So, Well, we're going to get your question about Gleason in a little bit, but we'll mention it. But I want to make sure we stay on track here. Well, so we'll keep that on there. And when we get to the New Orleans Saints stop, we're going to insert it and, and keep on track. But that said, you know, I used to drive by this place an awful lot, but my, mine alive. I-94 Pawpaw High School in Michigan. You graduated. Tell me a little bit about Pawpaw. Well, I was an Army brat, so I kind of went to school. Uh, you know, we moved all over the place, but my dad was from Lawrence, Michigan. And so uh, before my junior year in high school, we were actually stationed in uh, Vicenza, Italy. And, uh, you know, so my freshman and sophomore year, we were, we were playing in, like, the Department of Defense school system. And uh, I think my dad had enough vision to know that, you know, at that point in time, I was, a, a, you know, a big fish in a small pond. And, right. you know, back in those days, you know, if, you know, there, it was before the Internet, right? I mean, there was right. no there was no huddle. I mean, you know, I remember our high school games were filmed on 16 millimeter film. And so... Mm -hmm. If you were going to be recruited, you had to be someplace where those college recruiters were going to get a chance to see you, watch you play, or come in, uh, come into school to watch that one copy of the game film that the uh, that the head coach had locked up under. You know, it wasn't leaving the wasn't going to leave the building, and so it was a lot of, a lot different, a lot different time. And and you know, I was. Uh, grateful that my parents trusted me uh grateful to a lot of people that they kind of took me in and and uh you know gave me a place to stay and uh you know it was i didn't realize at the time but the, it really was a big step forward in terms of my independence in terms of being able to you know handle the moving <laughs> which was to come <laughs> so I can only imagine. Well, you segue into this really nicely. Now, I also it. say, you know, we had three, like I had three high school coaches at Pawpaw that all played major college football. Uh, our, yeah, Don Moorhead was my head coach, and he was uh, he was actually Bo Schembechler's first quarterback at Michigan. Uh, went to the Rose Bowl in, I think, 1967. Uh, Kim Rokamp who was an All-American at Michigan State. And then uh, Rick Smith was an all Mac uh, player at Western Michigan. So that was one of the reasons of, uh, you know, it was an attractive situation for me was the, the staff was so experienced and they were all former college football players. All right. So I got an interesting thing here while we're on the traveling thing. We're going to be on that all night. Anyways, you lived in eight zip codes in Italy and Ethiopia before you turned 18. I got to hear this one. So do they. Yeah. I mean, again, just dad being military, um, yeah. you know, again, we could probably do another story about this, but like my dad was, uh, you know, graduated from high school, went enlisted straight into the military. And the first place he's stationed is uh, Asmara, Ethiopia in Africa. There was an Italian colony there. He was, I think, 19 or 20. Uh, my mom was 18. Uh, she didn't speak English. He didn't speak Italian, but somehow or another, they ended up together. And, you know, uh, mom had me when she was 19 and, you know, they were married and, you know, the rest is history. But mm -hmm. yeah, uh, you know, from there, I don't know, we came back to the United States. Um, and I know, I remember Washington, I'm um, I can remember Washington, D.C., uh, North Carolina, two tours in Kansas, two tours in uh, in Georgia, and then uh, Germany, Italy, um, Michigan while my dad was in Vietnam. Um, 
those are all the only ones I remember off the top of my head. Okay. Well, Vogel alluded to this a little, but we're just, and we talk, he already talked about you playing wide receiver and quarterback over at Central, but the reality is you also graduated in health and fitness back in 1987. So while you were playing quarterback, how important was it to have a degree like that in health and fitness while you were playing so you have a better appreciation of conditioning and so forth? Honestly, I mean, I think it was great, but but truthfully, I mean, I, I had no idea what I wanted to study when I went to college. I, I knew I wanted to play college football and – you know, I think uh, I don't want to minimize the education that I received because right. it, mean, it means a lot to me. Um, but at that time, I was, to be honest, brutally honest, I was just trying to stay eligible to play. <laughs> and, and, and I walked on at Central. I didn't have a scholarship. I just, you know, I, I probably was a Division three athlete that right. wanted to play Division one, and, uh, you know, just walked on and, and earned a scholarship in my final year. Not wrong with that, Coach. Not at all. I mean, listen, when we go to college, you know, we could probably take on a degree. We never use it anyway, so it's a difference. <laughs> you certainly, obviously, we, your history speaks for itself that you were able to use the education and be a part of football. So now this is where it gets really fun for us. We're going to talk about your coaching stops and the frequent flyer miles you have. So I don't have a calculator. Don't ask me to come up with all this stuff. I'm not going to do it. So you can go into as much detail as you want in either long or short, depending on the stop, however you want to do it. Okay. I was in high school. You're in, in 87. You're an assistant coach. Is that correct? And I was the, it was a co-head coach at prior to that, um, I mentioned my last place my dad was stationed was Italy. Okay. I went went home. I went to Italy for Christmas break. Uh, my mom had a, my mom was my mom had a very accomplished career in the American Red Cross. One of her one of her volunteers was the head coach for an Italian team. So I took a semester off of school and went to Italy for six months and was a player coach for an Italian team in Verona, Italy. Okay. Verona Redskins, if I remember. The Verona Redskins, yep, you got it. And then and then came back and I had like, you know, eight, nine credits left to graduate. So I was the co-head JV coach at Mount Pleasant High School while I was, you know, finishing up my undergrad. So that sounds good. Uh, All right, well maybe, I'm gonna mention these schools and you tell me the role. You're you went, right. up, you went up to Maine, right? Yep. And 90, 88 to 91? Yes. Talk about that. Graduate assistant, uh, again, three head coaches in three years. It was uh, Tim Murphy, who's at Harvard now. Uh, Tom Lichtenberg uh, came in. And Coach Lichtenberg really gave me a big break because as a second-year graduate assistant, uh, you know, a smaller school, but still, you know, great experience. I got had the opportunity to be, I was actually the wide receiver coach, met with the guys, put in the game plan, graded everything, um, you know, as a, as a second year graduate assistant. So that was tremendous. And then uh, Coach Lichtenberg left to go to Ohio University and then a uh, fairly well-known guy by the name of Kirk Ferentz came in as the head coach. And Coach Ferentz actually hired me to my first full-time position. Really? No kidding. That's pretty good. And so I was uh, wide receivers and special teams. Okay. All right. Lee, Lehigh, 1992. Yep. Um, running backs and special teams. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, Army. Boy, that's not an easy gig. <laughs> Bobby, Bobby Ross, Ross actually. Bobby <laughs> Ross actually coached there, but talk about your army experience. Uh, phenomenal. Uh, still keep in touch with a lot of those young men, uh, which are now grown men. Um, you know, a tremendous laboratory, uh, just by virtue of the fact of the number of bodies that you have out at practice. Um, you know, my first year, I was on the defensive side of the ball, and I did special teams, and then the following year. Um, I really became one of the nine assistants. The NCAA eliminated the recruiting coordinator role, and uh, our head coach, you know, Coach Bob Sutton, who's also a Michigan man, um, had the idea of 
putting me in the recruiting coordinator role and then giving me special teams because, uh, as he put it, I wouldn't be bogged down in staff meetings. I could work independently. And then uh, when I was done with my game planning, I could I was always available for, you know, to work on recruiting, which was, you know, it's a gigantic undertaking anywhere. But at the service academies, uh, again, especially back then, it was uh, it was a never ending job. I mean, I think I was in that role for three years before I even took any time off in the summertime. Um, you know, of course, at West Point, you know, the kids show up a little bit before July 4th uh, and somebody's got to be around. And, you know, you have 100 freshmen and, uh, you know, I was probably the only one on the staff that knew all of them just because I was a recruiting coordinator and I had dealt with them, you know, in some way, shape or form, either getting them to the West Point prep or, you know, getting them directly in school. So, um Man, probably, uh, probably one of the fa one of my favorites. Probably one of my favorite, if not the most favorite stop that I've had. Just because um, the institution, what it represents, and then the you know the young men that you got a chance to work with, and the quality of people, and just knowing what they're you know knowing what's ahead of them you know when they when they graduate and then you know beyond their military service i mean it, it was a great honor to have worked at uh, at west point well you go from west point to a military town <laughs> and i'm all too familiar with this one the jacksonville jaguars as i look at your bio here 99 to 2000 and one year i believe you're an assistant special teams coach right yes i was i started off as the assistant special teams coach and then in uh 2002 when coach frank gantz retired i became the coordinator and you know that whole time i worked for coach coughlin which again it was a blessing to be able to come in you know to be able to come into the nfl uh in that role because you know i think uh you know, the thing that gets young coordinators uh, in the NFL is not the X's and O's. It's it's all the other stuff. It's how you practice. Um, you know, how you how you communicate with the players. Um, remember when I first got the job on my interview, Coach Coughlin said this to me, and I never forget it. He said, he said, you know, John, he goes, there are a lot more parallels between the NFL and high school football than there are the NFL and college football. Oh. And I really didn't understood what that meant until, you know, really until we got through training camp and then got into the season. And then I'm like, okay, I get it. You know, it's, it's the number of bodies that are out of practice, you know, in college football, you've got, you know, most division one schools are going to try to carry 120 players. And so your offense and defense, you practice separately. The offense is on one end, the defense is on the other. Mm -hmm. You have your your uh, your show team, your scout teams, right. and you rarely come together unless it's for like a couple periods during the practice. Well, in the NFL, it's like high school. You have offensive plays, periods, then you flip over and you have a defensive period. Mm -hmm. And those offensive players, you know, there's there's only eight practice squad guys. Some of those frontline players are going to have to jump in and give reps as a show team for whatever you know for the you know except for your star players everybody's you know expected to contribute and so that's kind of what he meant really was the the numbers and how you manage the numbers on the roster so you know, like this stop here goes from jacksonville to green bay My yeah. Goodness. Uh, no, I probably I, had, yeah i, I, I think you probably invested some long times <laughs> right there and uh, weren't you there yeah, I, ne I neglected to, to mention that the, the very best thing that came out of uh, Jacksonville was I met my wife, Paulette. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. You know, we're we're still, you know, going strong. And, and you know, when we met, she said, I'll, I'll go wherever you want, but please try to keep me where, you know, she's born and raised in Florida. She said, try to keep me where it's warm. Uh, you know, and for God's sake, don't take me to Green Bay and, you know. <laughs> Lo and behold, <laughs> that's that's, that's kind of how it's worked. Anytime she says, "Gosh, I hope we don't end up there," or those poor people there, it's like ends up where we're going, because the next stop was, you know, 
from Green Bay was New Orleans. And right. I remember watching, you know, Hurricane Katrina and all the devastation. Right. And Paulette saying those people, poor people, gosh, it must be awful. Man, I'd hate to, you know, I'm glad we're not there. And then, you know, six months after Katrina hit, we were we were in New Orleans with Coach Sean Bate. All right, so let's back up a little bit here. You really do a – you had a move here better than Barry Sanders when you dodged the screen base top with your other half. So what was your reaction? And I'm putting you and Barry Sanders coach in the same sentence this time. You were right there. That was a – I don't know, what do they call that, a jackknife or whatever, Swiss Army knife move? I don't know what they call this stuff. I don't even care. So was what was your wife's reaction when you ended up going to – no, I'm not going to – Surprisingly, surprisingly. I, I mean, maybe not surprisingly. Surprisingly, if you met Paulette, uh, she loved it. I mean, she, you know, she did because, gosh, she grew up going to football games and, and uh, at the swamp. You know, she's a she's a ball chick. She knows more about football probably before she met me than than a lot of men do. And so, you know, once she got up there, she was she was good. And and our daughter was born, so I mean, she was pregnant half the time we were there. So that that helps. You know that helps. <laughs> Are you telling me that your daughter was a, is a Wisconsin girl? Yeah, she was born in Green Bay. Yeah. Wow, that is interesting. Okay. Two boys <laughs> born in Jack. The, our our sons are both born in Jacksonville, and our daughter's born. She's the cheese head. She's born in Green Bay. Hmm. All right. Well, that's okay. Now we can tie this thing into New Orleans. We're getting some activity in the chat room, and now it's time to insert a Will Vogel comment. And this is one that I like to, and I've been in New Orleans after Katrina, but go ahead, Jeremy. I remember when you called the play that became the infamous block punt that Gleason blocked against the Falcons after Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, that was a pretty special night. Um, you know, just the energy in the stadium. I mean, I think uh, there were two Bonos in the house. There was the U2 Bono, and then I was, like I say, the Me Too Bono, which is me. Um, yeah, you know, Gosh, I mean, that atmosphere was probably as close to a Super Bowl as, you know, as you can get in the regular season. It was a Monday night game. You know, both teams were still undefeated. It's a, you know, rivalry game with Atlanta. And it was the reopening of the Superdome. And I think the the significance of that play for the people of New Orleans, I mean, they built a statue of Green, of uh, Steve Gleason that sits right. out there. It's titled "The Rebirth," and so I, I think that says about all it needs to be said. But I mean, uh, Steve made a great play. It happened almost exactly the way we drew it up, which is something that rarely happens. Um, but yeah, that was uh, you know I think the coolest thing was uh the monday night crew in the in the booth they 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 just stopped talking you know uh after they called the play they just stopped talking and i mean you watch the replays of it the cameras are panning around to the the fans and i it was like it was like all of that emotion from everything that had transpired in the previous year kind of just exploded in in one three second play you know that's that's about what it was like but it was pretty you know again um i, I would say that's probably the probably the most more memorable moment of my career okay so you know in between your new orleans stops, you did have a your wife got her ability to go to florida but this time my neck was south florida what about the miami dolphins how would you describe your tenure, tenure great time? you know great 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 football franchise um you know that we were there you know got a chance to work closely and be around uh coach parcells uh learned a lot um you know and finished kind of rocky got run out of town but you know that's that's just the the breaks of the game i mean sometimes you know you're gonna have bad games as a coach you're gonna have bad games as a player you're gonna have you're gonna have bad days in whatever, whatever job you do. And it's not, mm -hmm. you know, that's not where you measure yourself. It's where, what do you do after that? And right. is, what, is how you measure yourself. All right, so we have a question in the chat room, Jeremy, coming from Bo. 
All right, what do you guys think of the Thursday night football flex schedule getting approved for this season? After um, what happened last year, <laughs> if you're asking me, they had to do something, or Jeff Bezos might have said, I reject this contract. You can find somebody else to cover it. Right. Well, Ann, what's your thought, Coach? Well, I always look at it from the standpoint of the players. I think those, those Thursday night games, as popular as they are and as much – as a fan, as I like to watch them, um, that's a really tough turnaround for the players to play on Sunday and then come back on Thursday night. Um, man, it flexing them, I, you know, that is that'll be interesting because you know I think mentally, you know, I, I, I it's going to be interesting. And I hope that they give them at least a week in advance so that they can be prepared because, you know, when, when you do those things, your routine is going to be different. And, and that's my own, that's the only thing. I think it's great for the fans. Uh, my concern would be for the players and recovery time and, you know, preparation time and all those things. Great question, Bo. Really? That was an excellent question. Yeah. Very George, good. Any thoughts about any thoughts about this one, George? I'm against it. And coach, I got to disagree with you. It is a slap in the face to the fans. Fans plan their trips to the stadium with their families. They rent hotel rooms, they rent campgrounds, uh, they plan it out. And then the NFL comes along with the big mighty television sword and says, oh, sorry. I mean, I agree with you. They are going to give them notice. I think they said as much as 18 days notice, 15 days. I read something today, mm -hmm. but I, I don't like them. I don't like them at all, and I never will. I'm sorry. Thanksgiving Day, I'll give you that. That's a right. holiday. That's a tradition. But uh, I, I and the players too. I I agree with you, Coach. I mean, it's hard for the staff, and hard for the players and the training staff to get everybody ready. But, but like I said, my overriding thing is it's you're you're really really disrupting the fans. Well, yes, I don't. if you flex it right and change like. Oh, are they saying you were going to play on 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 Sunday and now you're playing Thursday? Right, they're moving that, it up, up three days. Right. Yeah, that's 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 going to um, be. It's really actually hard. four weeks notice they give when they're going to flex it, according to Bo. Four weeks. Okay. Well, that's yeah, twenty-eight even better. days. Is that twenty-eight days? You usually don't get a cancellation fee if it's within like ten days. You do. So I get it. I mean, the only thing I'll add to it is NFL players are a creature of habit. That's all I can say. And coach, you know that everybody they're all in a routine, right? So they. Yeah. Expect certain things to be a yeah, certain. I mean, when you when you play a Thursday game, you don't yeah. you know you're not practicing that week. You don't. I mean, you're gonna get you're gonna be walkthroughs. You know, walkthroughs and a lot of video. Yeah, yeah. walkthroughs as much video as you can, and you're trying to carry as much from the game plan from the previous week into that second week, just because you won't have time to install. All right, so let's. Let's go back to your second tenure in New Orleans. Obviously, at that point, it's 2011. And Will Vogel makes yet another interesting point that that play needs to go to Canton if it's not there. Yeah, I mean, and let's not forget it's ALS, Amelon, Lou Gehrig's disease. So, right. you know, tell me what it was like in 2011 playing for, you know, being a part of something like that. Um, that was, you know, that was a great, it was great to be back. You know, it was, um, it was awfully, uh, you know, I needed a lifeline, you know, and, and Sean Payton gave me a lifeline. And, you know, it's funny because I left as a coordinator there and Greg McMahon is a good friend of mine, was my assistant. And in 2011, I came back and we, we just reversed roles. Uh, he was the coordinator and I was his assistant. And, you know, one of the things that I got to do um, was uh, take Steve Gleason and you know, when we went to that final playoff game in San Francisco, which was, shoot, that might have been the most physical game that I've ever been associated with. I mean, that game was insanely physical. Um, but, I, you know, I I took Steve and I got him on the plane and uh, got him off the plane and turned him over to his brother. And then after the game, got him from his brother, got him on the plane and got him back off the plane when we got back to New Orleans and turned him, turned him uh, over to his wife, Michelle. So, um, 
I, I am a big believer in providence, and I think that I think that God puts us in the places where He wants us, where He needs us, and you know, uh, I think that I was supposed to be back there for for those reasons. And uh, it was a great great year. Um, it was tough because my family stayed in Florida, so we you know, we kind of you know we we commuted that year, but. Um, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of good memories from that, from that season. Are you still in touch with Steve Le Gleason a lot? Yeah. I mean, periodically I check in on him. I, it's, it's a little bit easier to, to communicate with other people that are closer to him because I mean, for him to, you know, for him to communicate now, it's all via text message and, and, you know, he's, but he's still plugging away. I mean, he's doing, he's doing well. Good. All right, well, let's go back to Jacksonville. You had another tenure there. This time you were with Mike Malarkey. Yep. That was a rough year. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I actually covered it. <laughs> well, I believe that. We'll, we'll keep that one of your shorter comments. I believe that you won just a couple of games, right? Yeah, I, remember, right? yeah, I, think, we won, I think we won two or three. I can't remember. Yeah, I think I believe. Yeah, but, you know, you obviously – Work with my good buddy Dan Edwards. Dan Edwards yeah. is certainly one of the nicest guys you could ever really. One work of the with. best in the business, right there. Yeah, he's a guy that I think so much of. Good friend of mine. I'm looking forward to seeing him in the chair. All right, now Mr. Ballrank has a Detroit Lions head on there, and now we take our way back to the Midwest. You're with the Lions from 13 to 14. Tell us a little bit about that. Tremendous. It was great to be back in Michigan. Um, you know, Jim Schwartz and Coach Caldwell were both outstanding to me. Um, you know, that that team in the first year in Detroit, I mean, we were loaded. We were, you know, we might not have been a great team, but we were a really good special teams outfit. Um, the next year we, we lost a couple guys, not as good, but, you know, those were, those were really two really fun years, um, you know, always appreciated the Lions, but maybe not so much uh, until after I worked there. You know, the, the Ford family and what they put into that franchise, I mean, they really don't get enough credit. I, I think they they don't. I mean, uh, as fans, you know, when, when we, we're, we expect a lot as we should, um, but I, I really think the Fords go, it's just, I'll say this, I've worked in a lot of great organizations. None were better than than the Detroit Lions in terms of a work environment. Um, you know, having all of the things at your disposal to help you do your job to the very best of your ability, and the you know knowing that you had uh, uh, 100% support by ownership, and just doing everything in a first class manner. I mean, there there wasn't. There isn't anybody in my mind that has done a better job that than with that than the uh, than the Detroit Lions. Okay, Jeremy, go to the chat. Uh, Dom Derubis, uh, one of our Detroit buddies, says question for John: Who is the best kick returner you ever coached? Uh, Darren Sproles. <laughs> I know. I, I, I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm going. Well, I'm looking at the years, and I think he just missed out on Stefan Logan. Yeah. So, so I didn't, I didn't, it had to be. It had to be uh, Darren Sproles at that Darren point Sproles. when I'm looking through those list of teams. Yeah. Yeah, great question, uh, Tom. That's a really good one. I like that. Now, if you'd have been yeah. Chicago in the late 2000s, you yeah, would have said mean, Devin Hester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, had to play yeah. Against, you had to coach against him, you know, twice a year. I mean, it was like, right. you know. I, I'll tell you what. I used to like watch Darren Sproles. That, so did everything time, What's that coach? So did everybody else, including the officials. That's why, you know, not taking a thing away from him or anything that they, but they, you know, they benefited maybe from one or two missed calls just because human nature. I mean, the, the guy's the, the guy was a, is a freak. I mean, he really was. He was, you talk about a scary dude. It's like, you don't want to put the ball anywhere near him. You know, I mean, yeah. it's only a matter of time. You know, if he touches it, if he touches it too many times, he, he's going to hurt you because he's just that dominant of a player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Don Derubis brings up another interesting point that Jeremy just touched on. Mel Gray and Devin yeah. Hester, they were over really Devin. He's saying Mel, Mel Gray, Gray over Devin. Yeah. Yes, Mel Gray he goes, yeah, great. I said it. He was great. 
Yeah, I like Mel Gray. Mel and Gray's he, kind of the guy that well, Mel Gray was probably the you know the first guy that was like you know became known for that, right? I mean, uh, they're you know. I, I don't ever I, I don't like rankings, you know. It's yeah, like, I don't rank them either. I don't know. But I, I think they're both they're both guys that are, you know, they're both uh, Hall of Fame caliber players for sure. So all right, well I'll tell you what, coach, we're gonna keep the chat room going, then we'll keep your stops rolling at the same time. All right, we'll go back to Will Vogel. So I love about an active chat room. It means I'll never lose my voice during the course of the show. All right, well, uh, go ahead, Jeremy. Are you close with anyone who's still in the NFL player or coach? Um, considering he just coached two years ago, I'm quite sure he is. <laughs> Thousands. <laughs> right. Uh, I was yeah, like, I'm looking one, at this list and I was like, it's one of the reasons. Uh, it's one of the reasons that uh, BSN hired me. I think is because of my network. So, yeah, um, yeah you know, and ultimately, you know, I, I was gonna. I'm kind of mad at myself i didn't make this uh point earlier but i know um when we were talking the other day i said it but you know it's it's really not about the places so much as it is the people that are there right i mean it's it's the it's the it's the you know it's the individuals the coaches and the other and the players that are in the hallways every day that's that's what makes a place special it's not you know it's not really the the colors or the logo on the helmet. It's 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 the people. And uh, you know, I was just very very fortunate. I've been very fortunate that I got an opportunity to work with and around a lot of great. I think one of my pet peeves is that a lot of people tend to characterize uh, stereotype professional athletes. And yeah, I mean, we do. You know, there's some a-holes for sure but the majority of the guys that i've worked with have you know they want to get better they want to be you know they're the game's important to them they 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 want to learn that you know they're professionals or they want to learn to be a professional and and um you know again the overwhelming majority of the guys are awesome guys uh and every 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 profession is going to have, you know, one or two bad apples here and there. But unfortunately, in, in our society is we would rather, you know, we would rather put the guys that screw up and do dumb things. We want to put them on a pedestal or, you know, it, because it's more interesting to talk about that than to talk about the 20 other guys that are, right. you know, doing everything right and have foundations and have charities and, and are, you know, doing things to try to help people. All right, so I've got to answer this one here. And so you guys take it for what it's worth at face value. All right. Duncan Lozinski, how can you guys be talking about football at a time like this with the Panthers in the Eastern Conference Finals? Duncan, I'm putting it up here because you know what? I have a responsibility to realize that I know where your allegiances are. So what I'm going to do, Duncan, with this comment is I'm going to ask you to be our crack update person about the Florida Panthers and you're more than welcome to give us updates so that we can count you as the guy that's leading breaking news about the Florida Panthers and the Carolina Hurricane. So with that said, Duncan, the next thing I should hear from you in the chat room is a score and we might even comment on it. But thanks a lot for hey listen, you're tuning in. We can't be that bad, right? You're watching the Panthers and watching us. So we'll we'll just take that Duncan as a very nice compliment. Thank you very much. So there you go. All well, Joshua Bernstein says one nothing catch, but Duncan will still make you our crack guy anyway. So, all right. So let's continue on as the victory tour for Coach Bono continues. You went up to Central Michigan. You were their head coach, 15 to 18. And obviously, you know, you had four teams. I know your last year was a little rough, but talk about your entire experience over at CMU. Um. I mean, very gratifying for the most part. You know, I think it was a, a goal of mine to be a head coach. Specifically, I had, you know, it was kind of like the uh, the dream job for me. And if it had gone to according to plan, I'd still be there. I mean, I had a tremendous amount of um, love for the institution and the football program there. Um, you know, uh, inherited a pretty good team. 
uh, you know, went to three bowl games, uh, you know, the first three years. And, uh, you know, in the, in the last year, we were just, we were just a really young team, but, uh, you know, uh, I've been asked, you know, my bitter, you know, for, for being let go and the answer is no. I mean, when you, um, when you get into this profession, you understand what the pitfalls are. Uh, you know, what's at, you know, what the risks are and you know, you have to win. Um, and if you don't win enough, then, you know, you're, you're go probably going to lose your job. And, you know, I think we were one in 11 that last year and, and that's simply not good enough, you know, even though we were, we're young and, uh, you know, there, again, there's a lot of things that contributed to that, but the bottom line is, you know, it wasn't acceptable and it wasn't acceptable to me uh, or anybody that's a fan of the program and, you know, they deserve better. Um, do I think I should have gotten fired? No. Um, is it justifiable? Absolutely. You know, because I didn't win enough games that year. Um, you know, wished I would have had an opportunity to, you know, redeem myself with one more year, but, you know, the powers that be didn't grant that. And so, you know, we hold our head high, we march forward and, you know, we're, I'm proud of what we did. I'm proud of the things that we did accomplish there. You know, we brought the, uh, you know, the, the we were, uh, we were, we had a share of the MAC championship in the first year. We, you know, we won the, brought the Michigan, Michigan MAC trophy back to Mount Pleasant in 2017, which it had been, gosh, 10 years since that had happened. So there, there was a lot of positives and, you know, got to see a lot of young men graduate and are doing well. And there's a few players that we coach that are still playing and making a living out of it. And so, uh, I look back at it as mostly positive and, and really no regret. All right. Well, you stayed in the state for another year with the Lions in 2019. What's your thought? Um, you know, good year. Learned a lot. Um, you know, again, tough year, uh, tough year record wise. I mean, you know, uh, at any level, when you lose your quarterback, it's going to be, it's going to be a rough, it's, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, in the NFL, I mean, I don't know how many guys we played that that year, but there was only one of them that was named Matt Stafford, and uh, it just it just puts so much more pressure on every other part of the team, uh, you know, when you don't have your ace in that position, and uh, you know there was a a big bloodletting after that year, and so. <laughs> I had to go find find work again. Okay. And obviously your work went to Southern California where you were with the Rams in mm -hmm. 2020 and 2021. And yes, you did get a Super Bowl ring while you stayed around and gutted it out all this long. So let's just talk about the time you spent with the Rams. Um, you know, first year of COVID, man, you know, what a challenge, you know, but we still managed to make it in the playoffs. Uh, the following year took a different role, uh, like a senior, you know, senior coaching assistant. Right. Um, you know, again, you know, good year, had a chance to actually, you know, be in Florida working remotely that season, which was a, a huge bonus. Uh, you know, missed being at the games and everything, but it was still, you know, uh, still able to get my work done and, and meet remotely with, uh, with the QC, you know, quality control guys and, you know, do whatever projects they asked me to do. And, you know, it was, you know, would have been, a, would have been a little bit more fun to have, you know, actually been there every day if we'd have known we were going to uh, win the Super Bowl. But when, when I had the chance to move back to Florida and not have to pay whatever 16%, uh, income tax in California it was like getting a raise, like getting a big raise. So uh, I'm glad I was happy that we did it. And uh, my family was very happy that we did it. Yeah, to the tune of 16%. I didn't realize it was that high out in LA. Everybody talks about El Southern Cal. I understand. I love going there, but sure, I know it's expensive to live there. And your last stop, obviously, was Iowa State. You were there mm -hmm. briefly. And then obviously, you chose to retire. Yep. Let's think about that. Had a blast up in Ames last year. I mean, Matt Campbell does a phenomenal job. He's a good friend. Uh, 
his last year at Toledo before he went to Iowa State was my first year at Central. So we got a chance to to meet each other and, and uh, you know, just had a lot of mutual respect there. And, and you know, I was uh, available and he said, asked if I'd be willing to come to Ames. And I said, sure. And so, uh, again, you know, um, you know, Paulette kind of, she came, made it up to every uh, home game. Um, so she flew back and forth. So we did the commuting thing again, which wasn't ideal, but for, for one season we could do it. And then, you know, just really kind of afterwards, really after the season, really kind of prayed about it a lot and talked with Paulette and, and we just really, I didn't want to move my family anymore. We've got a great spot here in Palm coast. We're happy. And I had this opportunity come along with, uh, with BSN in a role as a business development uh, role. And uh, I'm able to piggyback that on top of my pension. So life is good. You know, the NFL pension's great, but you cannot be employed in the sport of football. So right now, even if, you know, it would uh, it would take a lot to get me out of this the situation that I'm in right now. We're, we're pretty happy. All right, so now that we've gotten through all the stops, which is not a big deal, I'll tell you, I like it because after all, this is a one-time shot, folks. If you want to see Coach Pano's stops, then you <laughs> must listen to this show over and over because here's the deal, okay? I got writer's cramp jotting these things down, okay? I'm telling you, my hand, okay, got a workout, you know, and I got – so I got to ask you, what mover – Helped you with all these stops. How did you move well, around from place to place? I get hives when I talk about movers. <laughs> you do. I can only imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't even begin to ask you which one because you were all over the place. Yeah, so. I, I, I don't know that I could recommend a moving company. They're, you know, they're, they try, they do, you know, uh, fortunately, Fortunately, you know, in the NFL, most of the time, the clubs, you know, cover your entire move, you know, because otherwise you'd, you'd go broke. You I really would. <laughs> Especially when oh, you move place in one year. Yeah. Is it? Is that exactly. right? You ever have to deal with storage units or did you at all? We kind of, we kind of avoided that, but I tell you what, I think, um, Oh man, I want to say I think the house that we're in right now. Yeah. One, I'm just doing like a one, two, three, I think this is the eighth house that Paulette and I have purchased together. Wow. That's not counting. That's not counting rentals. So. Uh, I don't know. I think we could probably open up our own real estate brokerage and we'd at least know where, how to price stuff. And we'd do it. we've, we've done it enough times. So that I've got a lot of, I, know, I learned all the do's and don'ts of buying and selling the hard way. Yeah, I, I, that's probably another statement. Okay. So I, I have to ask you this question. Well, being in college, first of all, what are your thoughts about the transfer portal? Um, I think it's good. I think it's, um, I think it's a little bit out of control. Um, I think that they just passed some legislation that I think is gonna gonna help that, you know, in terms of like just narrowing down the windows. But I mean, ultimately, I think that you know um, players should be able to to move if they're not they're not happy. Um, but what I think what you're seeing, you know, is you know you're seeing how um, transactional college football has become because of the transfer portal and and now NIL it's 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 truly it's becoming more and more transactional where you know um, you know I think you know my my one of the big reasons I got into coaching was because you know the people that I looked up to the most growing up were were my coaches um, those were the people that encouraged me the men that encouraged me, they, you know, they gave me, you know, I had a great role model at home and my dad, but they were also strong role models. The, you know, they were honest with me. Um, they helped, they made me, you know, held me accountable. Um, 
you know, they, they taught, you know, learned how to uh, handle success and adversity. And, uh, you know, I, I think the game just did so much for me in terms of helping me develop as a, as a man that I felt uh, that I wanted to pass that on. And, and so, you know, the player relationship, the mentoring aspect of football was a big part of what, why I wanted to coach. I wanted to, you know, I, I wanted to be that, you know, I wanted to be that person for someone else. And, uh, you know, I know someone's going to ask what's the difference between college and the, and, and the NFL and which one's better, which one do you like? Mo-? You know, I think they're both great. I think in college football, you do have the opportunity to make a bigger impact on a young man's life. And I, I think we're losing a little bit of that uh because of the transfer portal and maybe nil and, and that, those type of things well there you go don Darubis. all right go ahead jeremy the transfer portal and nil are right on the cusp of destroying the archaic nonsense that is college football in a good way but it's also done some damage to some smaller schools so i see both sides of that but the reason why the nil was put in and i'm going to stress this is because They lost all that money from EA Sports because they didn't want to share it with the kids from those video games for the college football and college baseball games. Those are due to come back now within a year or two. So when that happens, that money is going to go into a trust fund to each kid's image and likeness that they get upon graduation. And I'm all for that. Yeah, and and I think the NIL, the way it's written, I think it's a good thing. I, I do. I think that but again, anytime, whenever there's gray area, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna find people that are gonna try to work in the gray to bend the rules, yeah, or skirt it. And so, unfortunately, that's what that's what's happening. You know, I, I mean, you know, some of the some of the dollar figures and stuff that are getting thrown around for for somebody, you know, some of these kids who haven't even played yet, you know, it's it's uh, it's my it's mind boggling. It really is. And you know, again. I mean, there's got to be a happy meeting, you know, there's, it's got to be done the right way. You know, I think that, you know, I think honestly, some people, they're not cheating because it's not illegal, but I mean, when your whole drive is, to me, we should stop giving athletic scholarships. If you're going to pay, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and what the, you know, save them, don't let don't make the schools waste the money on the scholarships, just, Pay, pay them and let them pay their own school, own way for school. I've, I've said that for years. I've said it for about 10 years. DC 8091 for my, uh, oh, the kids, the college kids generate millions upon millions of dollars for these schools programs and they deserve their cut. I agree with that. Mm-hmm. That's full on. Hold on. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, this is a buddy from my, my channel. Uh, the transfer portal sucks except for kickers. <laughs> all right i want to get to a couple of interesting points those are pretty good all right coach i'm going to drop a couple of names out there for you okay right. mike sherman tony sprano what do they mean to you um you know very like mike sherman might be the most principled person i've ever met you know i mean like just a you you talk about somebody who like you know, walks the walk. I mean, Mike Sherman walked the walk. I mean, uh, maybe uh, one of the most, one of the more, probably the most underrated head coach that I worked for uh, hmm. because he was a great head coach and a uh, great man to work for. He was, he was a tremendous uh, mentor to me. Um, and when I was preparing for my interviews, you know, to interview for the Central Michigan job, uh, you know, Coach Sherman spent hours with me. You know, because he had done it. He'd been a head coach at the Green Bay, and then he went back and was a head coach at Texas A&M. And I knew a lot of those questions were going to be, you know, you've been in the NFL for 16 years. Now you're coming back to college. You know, are you? You know, how do you? You know, you know, how do you prepare for that? It's how. What are the differences? And and so you know, Coach Sherman actually you know gave me a lot of really good advice in terms of navigating that. You know. Uh, Tony Sperano, 
you know, God rest his soul. Just, you know, we lost him too early. Um, just a phenomenal man. Um, you know, great leader. Uh, really, really had a great command of, uh, of the team. His pulse, you know, finger on the pulse of the team. And, uh, you know, probably didn't get as much credit as he deserved as a head coach because, we were all underneath the Bill Parcells of the, you know, right. umbrella, but that, you know, that was Tony's team. You know, Tony coached the team and right. uh, did a really good job with it. And you already mentioned Sean Payton. So what's it feel like to be a Super Bowl champ? It feels great. You know, it's like almost like you get that, you know, you have a, I think you have a monkey on your back, you know, until you win one. And then, yeah. you know, but, but then, then it's like, okay, you want to, you want that again. You know, it's like, uh, you, 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 you want to, you want to feel that again. And so it is like a drug. Um, but there's, you know, to be able to say that, you know, you were a world champion. There are very few people that get to walk around and say that. Yeah. Yeah. You did it with Matt Stafford and you also did it with a kid here from Deerfield beach named Brandon Powell as well. Brandon yeah. Powell's a great kid. I, I had a chance awesome. to meet him a couple times. So yeah. I'll talk about Stafford, Brandon Powell. Uh, BP, you know, we had him in camp in Detroit, actually. He didn't make right. our team. Um, and, uh, you know, I was just really happy to see him get a break and stay and, and you know, and contribute and have a great year and, and win the Super Bowl. Okay, a couple more questions. I'm going to turn over to George and Jeremy. First of all, Okay, what stop was your most rewarding? Oh man, I, again, you know, I, not to dodge a question, but I'd say they're all rewarding in, in okay. one way or another because, again, we're talking about people. Uh, it's not it's not the places; it's the the people. You know, people that you get to share with, and you know, the people that you help develop, and then the people that help develop you. Right? You know, the people that you you know, that you're teaching and mentoring, but, you know, you're also always learning and evolving yourself. And so, you know, I've just been very fortunate to be around a lot of really, really good football minds, but also good people. Well, it's a fair answer. I have no problem with that at all. I mean, the reality is there's a lot of people, Coach, influencing your life regardless of where they're at. Yeah, it's just no matter so what you do, right? Yeah, I mean, right. Yeah. It just looks like your victory tour is a little bit more extensive than a lot of people. That's all I can. I'm just kidding with you, but you know what I mean. I mean, you know. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about something that we alluded to earlier. How did you like playing in Paw Paw? Um, man, for me, it was awesome. You know, it was uh, it was high school football in Michigan. You know, one of the I – mean, Texas, Florida, Michigan – Pennsylvania, uh, shoot, huh? In Georgia, Ohio, Ohio. Yeah, I mean, those are they're great football states. If you're playing high school football in one of those states, pretty good foot up, pretty good football. All right, so tell me the coach that had the most influence on you. Uh, my college coach, Herb Dramedy. Okay, uh, Coach Dramedy, just because you know he was always there for me. Uh, really you know continues to mentor me this day uh you know was fortunate enough to be around him even you know the, the last if you if you ask me what i miss the most about be, being the head coach at central michigan the, the thing that i miss the most is i don't get to see coach dramedy as often now you know where as a head coach i saw him you know every week or you know several times a week and you know he'd come in and he'd sit in my office and we'd have We'd talk about things and, um, you know, uh, that relationship of player coach never changed for, for me, you know, even after I was the head coach. Um, so without a doubt, it's coach Dromedy. All right. So let's go back. You said you collected your NFL pension and then enabled you to get this current position at BSN athletic apparel. Tell, tell me what it's like to not only get your NFL pension, knowing that you've paid your dues to do it. Now you're more of a settled down lifestyle in our state with no state income tax. It's weird. Well, nice life now, knowing you got the pension. And now you're working for BSN. It's weird. I'm still adjusting to life after football. And I think my wife's adjusting to life after football because, you know, for the last 25 years that we've been together, you know, 
seven months out of the year or eight months out of the year, I'm working seven days a week, you know, with uh, no breaks. And a lot of those days are, you know, 14, 16, 18 hour days. Uh, and now I'm home every day, you know, so it's like, I just got to learn how to stay the heck out of the way because this is, this is her castle. It's her domain. And so, you know, but all kidding aside, it's, it's nice. You know, it's nice to be able, you know, the, uh, you, you get used to the grind in coaching, you know, uh, the day in day out, you know, it's, 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 it's never boring. Um, it's hard to find that same. It's, it's hard to find that in like everyday, you know, everyday life, regular life. But, but, um, you know, luckily, you know, I'm on the water, you know, I've got kayaks, I got paddle boards, I got surfboards, I got a pool, I got a boat. <laughs> so I, I've got, you know, we've got some other things that can we can do to occupy our, our time. I, I love to grill out, you know, so I probably gained about 10 pounds since I quit coaching. But, <laughs> Um, well, you know what? I'm about to get a few gray hairs because of Don Deruba. So you know what? I got to put these comments up and I'm going back to back with them. All right. Let's initially talk about the NIL. Okay. Jeremy, read it. And then I'm going to, and coach, you're going to love the next one. And, right. and if Deruba plays his cards right, and yes, Deruba, if you play your cards right, then I'll mention this on the next, after we get done here. So go ahead, Jeremy. NIL also saved Alabama from what should have been the harshest sanctioning since the SMU death penalty. He's not wrong. I don't know. What do you think, Coach? No comment. <laughs> yeah, like, no, that's smart. All right, well, I'll, I'll let you comment on this one, though. All right, this is one here where you've – all right, Dom DeRubis, go ahead, Jeremy. I want you to translate this whole situation and scenario. Scott Morgan Ross, if you don't get John back on for an episode of Fire Up Chips, you would be remiss. And he puts a laughy cat face because he's a cat guy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, hey, John, is it safe to say we're going to have a lot of fun doing more of these broadcasts or what? Sure, absolutely. Anytime. I'm, I'm game anytime. Oh, yeah. There you go, Dom. Okay. So stay tuned. John is anything but a one and done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gonna, with that said, I'm going to turn over to Jeremy, George, and, you know, I've kind of, you guys have been very patient, so go ahead, Jeremy, you can throw a few questions and George Eichhorn can do, and by the way, just so you know, Coach, okay, George actually is an author, and he's going to tell you a little bit about it in a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to send uh, Jeremy one of these back. Yes, <laughs> yes, I'll take one. That being said, uh, Coach, uh, so you got to coach uh, many players um but while you were head coach at central michigan uh, mm -hmm. tell me what it was like working with cooper rush cooper is phenomenal cooper is like a coach on the field um you know just an outstanding person outstanding player and uh just really 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 proud of, of him uh really happy for him you know the success that he's had uh, it hasn't been easy. I mean, he's undrafted, right? He's an undrafted guy and he's going into his what sixth year in the league. You know, that's, that's hard to do. That's really hard to do, especially at that position. So, and, when, and, and, and when, you know, when he's gotten his opportunities, man, he's, he's done what those of us who know him uh, knew he would do. It wasn't, you know, people ask me, am I surprised? No, I'm not. I'm not surprised at all because I I just know how intelligent he is. I know his skill set and I know um, how hard he works and, you know, he's just doing the things that he's always done. He's got a great process, uh, tremendous work ethic and, you know, just really, really proud of Coop. And not only is he a great player, he's, you know, he's got a young family doing a great job as a husband and a dad too. And those are, those are really important things. I love this one. Cooper Rush costs a lot less per win than Rain Dakota. <laughs> George, you're getting all. 
Uh, poor Monty George. All right. Well, that's all right, George. George, it's your turn. Go ahead. Right, go ahead, George. You know, Coach a lot has said about coaching trees, okay? Mike Shula's coaching tree, Bill Parcell's coaching tree, and a mm -hmm. fellow that I think gets kicked in the butt always, and a good man, and a Hall of Famer, Bill Belichick. I want to ask you about that. What is that true about coaching trees and some not being good and some not? And I know it's hard for you to comment. You've got so many coaches that you work well, with. You, you would, with Belichick you would, gets a terrible shake. Yeah, well, you would say Bill Belichick's off of, uh, you know, he's part of that Bill Parcells tree. Yes. Right? Because that's who brought I me mean, you know, he play, he he coached for Parcells. Tom Coughlin's on the Parcells tree. Um, shoot. Sean Payton's on the Bill Parcells tree. You know, Tony <laughs> Sperano was on the Bill Parcells tree. Um, you know, Mike Sherman was on the Mike Holmgren tree, you know, so, uh, which would be the Bill Walsh tree, right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're real, right? They're real because, you know, the, the thing that you can't manufacture in any business is experience, you know, and, and you prepare and you study and you work. And you, you know, that's why opportunity is so precious, right? Because that's the only way you get experience is by have, you know, someone, someone deems you worthy of an opportunity and, and gives you that gift. And then, you know, you try your best not to screw it up. And, oh boy. Uh, you know, so, but man, uh, you know, I, you could make an argument that, you know, that Belichick's probably eclipsed Parcells now, you know, in terms of, but, but I would, I would, I would think that Bill would probably, you know, coach Belichick would probably give a lot of credit to, um, to Bill Parcells. All right. This one cracks me up. I have no Georgia, did I, or was that a word salad? All right, I gotta put this up, Coach. I'm Bill sorry, Vogel man. says I'm on Scott's coaching tree. He's my mentor, is what he follows up with. Yeah, yeah. And right, then, uh, God, God bless Vogel. Yeah. He's he, he was a work in progress from the beginning, but this guy has come a long way, Coach. I'm telling you, uh, he yeah. is. I, I've got a lot of guys in my tree, but Will Vogel's progressing pretty quick. All right, and now here's another one here from Tom. Tom no. Rubis has got one of the most unbelievable sense of humor I've ever seen. Go ahead. Bella Chief coaching tree does not exist. It's a few broken twigs. Proximity to greatness does not equal greatness. Ask <laughs> Matt Patricia. I mean, Patricia. <laughs> Listen, Coach, you don't, let me tell you something here. Here's the rule. You don't have to come on everything. If you decide to laugh, it's okay, because you know what? You know, this is what pays the bills. And we got people like this in here talking about yeah, it. And it means no, it's all good. I, I doubt that Bill cares. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, Coach, I'll tell you what. You want to, want to know how that guy found me over there, Scott? I commented on his Inside the Pigskin one night, and they brought up Matt Petrasha. And that's I've called him that since day one with that whole New York Jet Monday night football home opener fiasco. And he said, I got to talk to this guy. <laughs> he kept saying it the whole show because I kept giving good comments. <laughs> yeah, well, not only that, though, you, you want to know some coach? You talk about coaching trees. Uh, you know, I, I won't mention the name of the network, but I got removed from a group because the guy that was running it thought I was going to take all of his talents. And I said, I committed grand larceny snapping up smoke in here. And that was the end of my time in the group. So, you know what? I, no disrespect to that organization. There aren't many people that would crack our lineup anyway, but this guy here, Balric, he not only cracked it, he smashed it open. But, <laughs> you know, I want personality, charisma, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, you've dealt with how many different personalities, coaches have you been around? Come yeah, on, really. A lot, a lot of them. That's well, my point. Thanks. Well, you know, the thanks. one thing you have to learn, though, Coach, GMTA, you know what that stands for? No. Great minds think alike. Like, yeah, okay. Okay, so that'll be one of the things I bring up from time to time. Also, on our early edition of Inside the Pigskin, okay, Mel Farr Jr. You ever heard of Mel Farr Sr.? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, I was his son, Mel Farr Jr., is my co host. So I told Mel that I'm bringing you on, and you and Mel are going to be on some shows together, buddy. I got news for you. He's looking forward to it. I mean, hey, this is what it's all about, you know. We, uh, building relationships in and out of the organization, we come back, we have fun. If people can't have sure. fun interacting with each other, what? Now, I've done a horrible job. 
selecting the talent. So, George, okay, you talked about coaching three. I'm sure you got another question or two lined up. Well, the other one I wanted to ask you about, Coach, is the decision to send a bowl, a team to a bowl game at Central Michigan. You know, um, we've got this bowl in Detroit, the Motor City Bowl. It's had different Mm -hmm. names over the years. And I know how excited they are here when Central Michigan or even Western, uh, you know, is picked to play in Detroit. But from a coaching standpoint and from an athletic standpoint, would the team be better off trying to go to an out-of-town bowl game? Or, or are they very happy when, let's say, Detroit would pick them for the, uh, for the bowl at Ford Field? Well, it, to me, it was a win-win. Um, and I'll say this, okay? I called it macanomics. All right, the, the <laughs> Mid- Mid-American Conference doesn't have the money that the Big Ten has or the SEC. So, you know, it, financially, it's a much better deal to take a bus down to Detroit than it does to charter a plane and go somewhere else and play. Not only that is, you know, the, the majority of our players were from the state of Michigan. And uh, so... A bowl playing a, a bowl game in Detroit was like adding another home game for us. Um, you know, man, yeah. that was my first year, so I didn't have a lot to compare it to. But looking back, the the you know the Quick Lane Bowl, which it was when we went, the, the, those people did a fantastic job with everything. Um, just the accommodations, where we stayed, the activities. You wouldn't think there's that many great, great things. There's a there was a ton of activities we did, you know, uh, through the bowl game. That you know the kids, the kids had a blast. Um, their families, the you know, their families could all afford to go there and be at the game. We had a great turnout for the game. We sold a bunch of oh, tickets. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, you, you'd like to, yeah. Who, Everybody wants to go to some exotic, you know, location, but uh, you know, you're you're in Detroit, but you're also getting to play in the dome. You're playing indoors, controlled yeah. environment. It's you know, I really, you know, for Central Michigan, it was. I would have someone said you're going to go to bowl games the next five years. Uh, I guarantee you, you can go to a bowl game, but you're going to have to go to the Quick Lane Bowl. I would take that deal for and do backflips i'd be <laughs> be uh ecstatic for it it was it was a great experience you know for well, our team. well let me tell you this coach george and i had an opportunity to attend a central michigan florida atlantic university get bowl game there and it was pretty neat I, mm-hmm. i'm sorry to disappoint you but i was covering fau so i felt like <laughs> a uh visitor that day but you know yep. i have to, you know you know what it's like your allegiances are to the one that sure <laughs> So I, I have to tell whoever you, whoever signing that walk. check, <laughs> what's that? Your allegiance is to whoever signs that check. Exactly, uh, and you know the amazing part about that situation. I believe that was a game when I covered the game. FAU's basketball team took on Kentucky, so I took out that game and then the FAU Kentucky game in Lexington and back to back days. FAU's plane got stuck on the runway and all that fog and I had to stop at a rest area. Luckily I was able to make it back to Lexington and back. And I would safe to say one of my days in Detroit I slept the whole day. But you know, but you're right. I mean it's it felt weird for me though being a road guy with Florida Atlantic. So I know where my allegiances were with, with the right. owls. In my sure. home state, I mean, and George was that right there with me, right, George? Yeah. I mean, yeah. wasn't it pretty crazy or what? Yeah, I remember you went to the basketball game afterwards on the way back. Yeah, but it was yeah. a great event. It was a great event, and you're right, Coach. They do a real nice job here in Detroit with the quick lane ball. Yeah, they did a fine, phenomenal job. No. All right, so let's go a little bit more in the chat room. I know, Coach, we're keeping a little bit longer, but, hey, we're on a roll with these people, We and they pay our bills, so we got to go out there. Dom DeRubis, all right, let's see. What's he talking about now? That's a great idea to get directional school from a bowl game wherever possible. That's, I guess you concur with that, right? Sure. Okay. All right, Dom, we got that one. Now he talks about his time when he went in 1997 when they had the inaugural Motor City Bowl, 97 Marshall and Randy Miss. Wow. <laughs> Randy yeah, Ross. Ross. yeah, he Ross. wants to yeah, say He's a little on the sarcastic side, so he knows what he's doing versus Deuce McAllister. Okay. 
guy. So, yeah. yeah, as you get to know Dom Naruis, you know, the one thing about him is he's a very sarcastic but entertaining individual. All right, let's see what else we got up here. All right, let's see. All right, oh, one. well, uh, here's one here that will make a lot of people laugh. I, sorry, Coach, it is what it is, man. We should have hired Patricia instead of Caldwell just so the Qu Quintricia era would be further in the rear view. <laughs> I'm not sure how to make on out on that one, now, Jeremy. You know, I do. I do. I know exactly what he's talking about because W.G. Brady wrote an article in 2018 about the assistant coach that no one was interviewing, and it was Dan Campbell and all the reasons why he'd have been a good coach for Detroit in 2018. Now this guy waits till they hire him in 2020, turns around and flips the script, reverses it, and says that's why they shouldn't have hired Caldwell. For still writing for ESPN at the same time. <laughs> All right. I will say this, though. I think Jim Caldwell is like one of the finest people that I've ever had the privilege to be around. And uh, it, it literally breaks my heart that he's not a head coach. He, it, he's a phenomenal, phenomenal person. And uh, Caldwell? Jim Caldwell. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Coach Caldwell was like, he was so good to me. Uh, when I got the central job, I don't know. I think he, he was almost as excited as, as I was because it was mm -hmm. something we had talked about. You know, we had, you know, I, you know, he met with every, every coach on the staff. What are your, you know, what are your goals? What are your, you know, what do you, you know, where do you see yourself five years from now, 10 years from now? I'd never had another NFL head coach that I worked with you know, uh, do that, you know, and, and so for that reason, you know, coach Caldwell is, a, is still a great mentor to me. Um, but he is, you know, you talk about, you know, minority coaches getting a shot. I mean, I'm, I'm disappointed that, that Jim Caldwell hasn't gotten another opportunity after Detroit, because in hindsight, he did a pretty damn good job. You know, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I agree. I don't think you no know, argument here. It's Not like here either. You know, one of the best regular season coaches we ever had. That's hey, listen, got. coach, you got a four to nothing vote on this one. <laughs> so, I, you know, what is it? Majority unanimous? I don't know what the word is for a four to nothing. What is it? Yeah. But yet, I do remember the last year we made the playoffs. And I'm not saying it was all his fault, but due to some poor play calling, that we had to have Matt Stafford bail us out with eight comeback wins. Yeah. Right. Out of nine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, well, you talk about Stafford real quickly, Coach, but let's go back to a Will Vogel comment. Uh, go ahead, read this one too, Jeremy. Coach, you're on a great program with some amazing gentlemen who are all mentors to me. Well, thank you, Will. Yeah, that was really nice. So, again, we're in a situation where I should have renamed it Mentors Over Mentors. But, all right, <laughs> let's go back to Matthew Stafford for a moment. What was he like, Coach Bono? Okay, Overall, as you know, did he accept, take you give him any advice or anything or what? No, you don't have to. Tough, right? Smart, uh, tremendous tr teammate. You know, like the, the guys in the locker room love Matt Stafford because Matt Stafford's easy to love. He, he's, you know, he doesn't have an ego. He treats everybody the same. You know, he in Detroit, he would always have like a, he'd have a, you know, he'd have a couple of events. He'd have like a uh, poker night at, you know, a poker night at his house after training camp. And he'd invite all the players over. And I mean, he was the house. And then he had, he was, his Halloween parties, I think, were pretty famous or infamous. <laughs> but it, it didn't matter if, if, the, if a player had just joined the, the team that week and was on the practice squad, you know. Matt was going to make sure that, you know, if he had something going on, that that, that player was going to get over there and that uh, he was going to be welcome, you know, just like, you know, somebody that he had played with for the last six years. You know, uh, you know, Matt's a he's, – he's, he's a winner. You know, he really is. And, uh, you know, I just always admired his his toughness, his physical toughness, his, his ability to – to play through through pain, which he he did quite a bit, um, maybe more so than he let on, and more than a lot of people would would know. Yeah, he has 
His wife, yeah. Kelly, seems like a pretty nice lady, too, doesn't she? She's yeah, a, little I mean, a little outspoken for me. I was just going to say she has a bigger just mouth a than Matt does. <laughs> did you but, uh, get to know But did you get I, to know Kelly at just, all? Just casually, just hello and stuff. She was yeah. always very gracious to me and my wife, my wife and I. So, yeah. okay. That's all right. Hey, listen, you know what, Coach? I got news for you. We always know our first show's going to be a little bit longer than most because, after all, Coach, it's your coming out party. <laughs> that, that being said, I um, I wanted to go back because we did miss one comment from Dom that he asked him. Go ahead. Uh, when you were coaching here that first time between Schwartz and Caldwell, wasn't that the same year we had Jeremy Ross returning? To yes. Yeah, I love Jeremy. Yep. And I remember he went to uh, the AAF for a minute, too, didn't he? The, that little league. That, yeah, he was playing for the team that was winning it all because he was returning kicks for them, too. Yeah. <laughs> what That's league cool. did you say? That AAF, the one that broke up after five games. Oh, I thought you meant Arena Football League when you said No, that. no, AAF, uh, uh, American Allegiance Football. Oh, what it was I, don't, I don't even remember it. Don't even remember it. Hey, hey Coach, it's funny how he brings it up, though. And let's go to Don's comment, but I, Jeremy brings up an interesting point, okay? Oh, go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and read that, Jeremy? Because now you got me intrigued about something. Go ahead, Jeremy. Yep. Matt Stafford should have been the next Brett Favre for John Elway, but all the missteps by the front office, constant turnover with coordinators, minimized him. He's absolutely right. In his tenure, I think he had 10 different offensive coordinators and four different coaches. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot for a quarterback to overcome. It and is. one of those was a, a, a ghost of Vince Lombardi, his kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joe. I think that was. Yeah, I think that was Vince Lombardi getting in his head from behind the grave, saying, "Sabotage this guy." <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. All right, so now Jeremy brings up the AAF, but now we have the USFL, the XFL, and the Canadian Football League. Somewhere along the lines here, I don't know if you ever did anything with the Canadian Football League, but now there's more leagues popping up, but you're not really associated with any of these other leagues outside no. of the NFL and colleges. No, I mean, I had I had my opportunities to go to the XFL and the USFL, but it just it wasn't the right opportunity or the right situation for myself and my family. And so um, I had to politely – you know, decline. But I mean, I think it's great because, you know, it just get, gives more more players an opportunity to play. Um, it's another proving ground. And, and the same thing with, uh, you know, with a lot of the coaches. One of my one of my guys that I really care about, Reggie Barlow, uh, is the head head coach for the uh, the DC Defenders in the XFL. Reggie's done a great job and. You know, I coached Reggie as a player in Jacksonville. He was our punt and kick returner. And then I've always stayed in touch with him uh, and, you know, uh, been a bit of a mentor to him as he kind of transitioned from playing into coaching. And so uh, just really happy for a guy that's really kind of right, right. been bouncing around at the HBC level, uh, but who I've always thought was a really good coach and deserved a shot. And I was just really happy to see him get, a job in the XFL as a head coach and and watch him do really well, which I knew he would. And, uh, you know, I'm anxious and excited to see what's in his future, you know, down the road, because I just really think a lot of Reggie as a as a human being and also as a as a uh, as a coach. Well, when you talk about your wife not wanting to go to cold climates, could you ever have imagined her in the Canadian Football League? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I had to mention that. You know, I won't even ask you what that game's about. We'll save it for later. But Don DeRubis, well, you know what? I have to put this one up, too. Keep the show going as long as these things go, Coach. I'm, at least you're retired. I'll have to feel too bad about a bedtime, I hope. Okay, but here you go, Jeremy. Stafford probably won't up playing long enough to pass Marino's career numbers, but he would have easily, and he's got a ring, but he'll never get mentioned in the same breath with Marino. Marino, how many no. head coaches did he have? Two? Yeah. Yeah. Shula and Jimmy Johnson. Right. Yep. Pretty good. All right, so coaches. let me ask you a question about this. I'm glad Don brought it up. I've always wondered about this, and now I think you're the right guy to do it. Okay. 
Uh, we all know that Don Shula, and I worked with him actually, Coach. My fr- I worked with the Lions, the Jaguars, and the Dolphins back in the early 80s, okay? Mm-hmm. And I got to know Coach Shula a little bit. He taught me some things. He, coaches, what's so good about coaches, too, that people don't understand is just because we're writers doesn't mean us younger guys can't pick their brain about what it's like to be successful. And I've done that a lot of times because we're human beings. Coaches are designed to really mentor and give advice. I don't care if you're playing it or not. And Shula was good about that. But do you think toward the end, okay, that Marino might have been a little bit too selfish about numbers when Jimmy Johnson tried to go out there and have a balanced running attack because he knew the ticket to winning a Super Bowl as he did a couple of times with the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, let's face the reality. You know, Dan Marino had a lot of good receivers. He really, really did. Mark Duper, Mark Clayton, and the list goes on, and Nat Moore. And I was down there for a lot of that. But then Jimmy Johnson, there's a guy that likes to balance. So, what are your thoughts about the way Marino handled things, his approach? And, of course, Tom mentioned, doesn't have a Super Bowl ring. Man, I've had too many concussions, and it was too long ago. I don't remember any of that shit, Scott. <laughs> oh, you know what? You know what? You, I wish I had a few concussions so I didn't have to memorize it because I have to deal with it in our neck of the woods, okay? But you know what? No, I'm not asking it to downplay. Or, yeah, no, I really, I really couldn't. Com- I, I don't feel like I'm in. I can't comment on that. I don't, I don't know. I, I no, wouldn't. I know, and I can appreciate that. But is it on? Is it common or not common? Okay, forget. Let's take Marino. The question where sometimes quarterbacks sacrifice numbers and not for the actual balance attack, and that may hinder their ability to get super. We'll take Marino out of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Man, that, to me, it's like. I, I I wouldn't say I, I haven't been many. I, I've been fortunate. I've been around some good ones, like like Favre, uh, Mark Brunel, uh, Drew Brees, uh, Chad Pennington, Matt Stafford. Right. Uh, shoot, man. Uh, For us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For us. I had to go there. <laughs> you know, I mean, great great players want to win. You know, I mean, that's that. I think the frustration with that you see when most players come out, and a lot of times it gets labeled as selfishness, or you know, it, it it's it's on teams that aren't winning, and those players feel like maybe they're not being utilized, or they're not getting opportunities that because they because they want to win. Wow. Um, you know. Uh, Rarely, I would say, you know, the guys that are are doing it to try to, those guys, we're not talking about those guys typically right. because they don't last very long. You know, that's that's, uh, they just, you know, if if someone's that flawed in their character and and they're mm-hmm. eventually, you know, you the, the when the talent levels off or you know your your tolerance for that as a coach or as an organization, you know is very little you know uh, unless it's like an example of a player that's whose talent is just right. above and beyond i was i can honestly say that, that because of the head coaches that i worked for right. i was not exposed to very much of that stuff at all you know because tom coughlin mike sherman <laughs> i'll go right down the line you know sean payton those guys are th- those guys are all coming you know from uh, backgrounds where they, they right. just don't, they don't tolerate it. It's not, you know, I mean, Sean, every one of those guys that I just mentioned, they would find what any, whatever, if, whoever the player was, they didn't care was going to get fined if they were late or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they always got to find the maximum. And really? the reason, the reason they were fined the maximum is, you know, they didn't want any gray area. And there was no, you know, shoot, I remember, you know, Sean Payton used to, would start every team meeting with order of the day, and he would read off the fines if there were any that day. And it wasn't in any way to berate the player. It was like telling you what was for lunch in the cafeteria that day. Okay. (laughs) So, I mean, Drew Brees missed meal, $3,000. all right, today's emphasis is a red zone. We've got to do a great job. I mean, it was that quick. But, man, you're sitting in that room, and you're trying to make the roster, and you just find, you just right. heard that Drew Brees got fined. You better not miss – I better not be late, you know. 
if he's going to find that guy, then I better make sure that, that I'm there. You know, I mean, uh, Mike Sherman, if, if someone was late for a meeting and you didn't turn it in, you might get fired. Wow. You might get fired. All right, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to go ahead and put three more of Dom's comments. We're going to wrap it up tonight. Coach, thank you very much for being so generous of your time tonight. I'm sure that a lot of our shows going forward won't be nearly this long, but I view this as your first opportunity to get out and people get to know you. And obviously, like you mentioned, we're looking forward to having you on more on more podcasts as time goes on. So we're just going to mention them real quickly, and then we're going to call it a night. So, all right. Well, all right, here, Dan Reno is the most fourth, most overrated fourth, Hall of Fame quarterback of all time. To name it, Bradshaw and Aikman. I don't know what Kool Aid you're drinking there. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I know what exactly he's talking about. Look at their regular season total career numbers. In the regular season, they weren't that big, flashy of numbers that you expect from Hall of Fame QBs. Okay. Well, now we have Jeremy B. as Don Drubis, automatic translator. Coach, you can react any way you want to. All right. Because you're giving everybody out here a great football education, and that's really important. Thanks, Coach. A lot of people, I guarantee, have stayed in here long enough because they want to learn. Go ahead. However, selfish Marino may have been about his numbers. Aaron Rodgers the last few years far trumps that. (laughs) Don, you don't have any opinions, I can tell you that. (laughs) The fact that Favre and Rodgers only have two rings between them is simultaneously sad, hilarious, and pathetic. All right, well, there you go. You definitely have run across one of the most opinionated guys. But Dom, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, he's good people. It. Keep it coming, Dom. <laughs> hey, hey, George, if you have to leave, Coach is here just to hang in there. No, I'm just kidding with you because you only have a book. to. If you want to leave without promoting the book, that's entirely up to you, George, okay? But, you know, <laughs> we will wrap it up anyways at some point. And, of course, we'll go there. Thanks for the kind words. <laughs> Oh, what a blast, Coach. How, you having a good time tonight or why? I've had a blast. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. George. Oh, yeah. Jeremy, right, well, pleasure meeting you, gentlemen. So with that said, let me go over a couple Same of more here. things real quick here, here locally. Just so you know, the audio version of the Sports Exchange can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast. Please hit the red subscribe button on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for 1,000 subscribers. Please also comment, like, and share the broadcast. Want to be a guest? Send topic ideas to South Florida Tribune at gmail.com. And you can also participate in the chat room. Boy, if you're anything like Dom DeRubis, you, you got to get in here quick because we're bringing a lot of people in. If you want to advertise cost efficiently, call me at 954-304-4941. You can also <clears throat> contact me on Twitter at Tribune South as well. We are live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you wonder why my voice is getting hoarse, well, who cares? I'm enjoying every last bit. All right, Don, you want more last thing? All right, there you go. I think Coach can live with this one. Not too controversial, right? Well, well last thing, okay. go Lions. And Lion King from my channel comes in and says, I heard we passed on Marino. <laughs> <laughs> well, so did a lot of other teams. So, uh, yeah, Lion was, King, you're right. And that's why Lion, Miami landed. The worst one was the one that uh, Don mentioned earlier is that we Passed on Randy Moss for Terry Fair. That worked out great, didn't it? <laughs> well, yeah. All right. Well, we'll leave it at that because we know George Icorn's approaching his bedtime. Yes. So. so should we let you promote your book, book, book first, George? You want to wait till the very end? Uh, we can promote it. It's a, a book I wrote, Coach, called Detroit Sports Broadcasters on the Air. A couple wow. of your buddies are in there, Coach. Okay, I'll give you some names. Mark Champion, Frank Beckman, Jim Brandstatter, mm-hmm. Dan Miller. Uh, nice. I, go back to Van, I go back to Van Patrick and Bob Reynolds, two of the great announcers that did Lions football, forward down the field with these guys. And uh, the book is available. There's a link at the end of my column on the Motor City Tribune page um, for, for the book. But, uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun doing that and going back uh, in the football days, uh, those old broadcasters, man. I bet you did. That's so yeah. awesome. It is. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And Scott's in the book, too. But not, yeah. with, not with football. He's in for uh, tennis and boxing. Yeah, Muhammad Ali and Jimmy Connors, Coach, what do you think? Wow. Don't worry. Good when we get to together there. in Palm Coast and Daytona, wherever you want to meet, <laughs> yeah. I got a good picture list to show you, Coach. 
<laughs> don't, don't worry. Hey, I got this guy in Florida. I'm gonna have a, I'll, him and I are gonna be old buddies up on the what do we call ourselves? The Treasure Coast? Is that what we call ourselves, Coach? Yeah, the Space Coast. Oh yeah, well whatever, Space Coast. Whatever. Yeah, really yeah, tre Treasure Coast. I, I, yeah, because Saint Augustine, right? Yeah, I guess. I don't even know. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. All I know is we're off the Atlantic Ocean, whatever else coast you want to call it. It is. What it is. All right, Jeremy, go ahead. Well, you can find me on the South Florida Tribune.com right underneath George Eichhorn there for the Motor City Tribune, where I write about, lo and behold, the Detroit Lions. And then you can also find me right here on this channel any day of the week that Scott needs me. It was twice tonight. I mean, he may even need me tomorrow and the next day, too. I don't know, but I'll do it. Then you can find me on my YouTube channel, which is Kneecap Biting with Smoking Jeremy B. You can also find me on Facebook at Motor City Kneecap Biters, and you can find me on Twitter at Smoking Jeremy B. Well, Coach, guess what? We, we put it all out there. You want you want to mention anything else about where they can locate you? You just want to be retired out in? I, I am proud to say that I am on zero forms of social media. That's by <laughs> choice. Okay. Uh, other than LinkedIn, you know, because for professional reasons. But uh, shoot, uh, find, me, find me on this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? I got news for you. I'm glad you brought that up, though, Coach. That's how I did contact Coach Bono, anyways, on LinkedIn as well. And obviously, and you know what? Well, let's put it this way you're on the sports exchange. You're going to be on Inside the Pigskin. We're going to put you everywhere. Fire up Michigan let's for a hot minute. You got a taste of what you're in for. Can you handle it, Coach? Oh, yeah. This is, this is fun. And one last. One last thing I want to do, special shout out to Candy Ebling, does an unbelievable job keeping everything up there. And our website is www.southfloridatribune.com. So with that said, I hope you've enjoyed this broadcast with Coach Bono, his first act. And obviously, we're looking for a lot more of them. You talk about a hit and a guy with a who's a traveling man. I can tell you one thing that we do have to look forward to, though, Coach, and, I'm, and I mentioned this at the top of the show, you and I will do a one-on-one -on -one interview soon enough about your being a cancer survivor that's something i want to do i feel it's something we need to do and we'll have a lot more football talk obviously a little bit shorter with different guests but we just want to make sure that as we went longer a little bit this first time that we wanted everybody to know who john bonamigo is and so they had a good background so they know what who we're going to be talking about down the line so coach like i said you know what? You have a new team, and we're proud as heck to have you on it. Really, thank you, thank you for having me, gentlemen. I really appreciate it, and it's been a it's been an honor and a privilege. Well, that's You're great, welcome. and I'm looking You're forward welcome. to seeing you up in Palm Coast and Daytona Beach, partner. Sounds we great, got a lot man. of a lot of projects to do. So, on behalf of George Icorn, Coach Bono, and Smoking Jeremy B, my name is Scott Morgan Roth, the Motor City Madmouth Coach. Okay, just so you know. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Sports Exchange, and we will catch you the next time, everybody. Thank you very much for everybody that went out there and participated in the chat room. As Dick Vitale would say, you're awesome, baby. Catch you the next time.